Have you ever been anxious about finding a solution to some problem and this tension shows up in a dream? How we can spend grueling days and even years trying to resolve the complexity and the confusion and pain of living in this world. Sometimes, though, sometimes we are graced with a moment of clarity on how to go forward. I was in a rough patch when attending divinity school some 25 years ago. I was still trying to piece together what I had experienced in Guatemala when I lived there during their civil war. I was there as a parrot conservation and a wildlife veterinarian. One night, my search for how to live took place as tossing and turning and one dream that seemed to go on the whole night. I was thinking that if I just looked hard enough and, and thought long enough, I could discover an important truth. And then I would learn the lesson I was supposed to learn. Near dawn, it paid off. The answer finally came and I suddenly awoke with the lesson and the lesson came from birds and it came in three words, parakeets and paracletes. The mood, I was so happy. I was joyful. I was at ease. But to tell you the truth, I didn't know exactly what it meant. I mean, I know what parakeets are, but I had to look up the word paraclete. It's a word mixed with Greek and Latin used in the Christian New Testament, and it means advocate or counselor or bringer of truth. What I dreamt is what I've been doing ever since in my ongoing ministry, advocating and supporting and witnessing to parents and the people who live with them. Now, maybe this lesson is a little bit specific for most of you. So let me share with you how Mary Oliver in her poem sometimes rephrases parakeets and paracletes. She calls it instructions for a life. Three rules, pay attention, be astonished, talk about it. We're gonna use birds as the ingredients for this recipe, but you could choose just about anything, another species, a mindful or spiritual practice, even the back of a cereal box. But birds are prettier and way easier. That's because birds are like everywhere or not as much as they used to be, but they are readily available to pay attention to. And we reap benefits when we do. According to the attention restoration theory, uh, theory people can concentrate better after spending time in nature or even just looking at scenes of nature or video. It helps ease the fatigue from informational processing. Looking at wildlife also helps us experience a state of flow, awaken sensuality, and increase spiritual fulfillment and feelings of well-being. Even if consciously we may not be tracking birds, subconsciously we are. A study in Europe found that a higher density of birds correlated with higher degree of life satisfaction as much as income did. It's like taking a walk in nature. Subconsciously, you reap the same physical and mental benefits even if you don't wanna go for a walk. Birds are doing the same things for us. And if you go out looking for birds and you don't see many or you don't really know what you're seeing, just the pursuit of them put you in nature which has immense benefits, such as decreased stress and increased creativity, kindness, and generosity. Looking up at birds is also good for you. Studies have shown that looking up can lead to greater feelings of awe, as well as helping people be more helpful and more ethical. Now, if you look up, and you combine it with bird song, this has been linked to a greater mental integration by quieting the inner chatter, as well as deconstructing and dissolving boundaries of self. Medical doctor, neurospecialist, Zen practitioner, and bird watcher, Dr. Jim Austin has written much about this subject and points out how in the Zen tradition, there are multiple stories of people becoming enlightened after seeing or hearing a bird, such as in this story. The disciple was always complaining to his master, you are hiding the final answer of Zen from me. He would not believe the master's denials. 
One day they were out for a walk and they heard a bird sing. The master asked the student, do you hear the bird sing? Yes, said the despised disciple. Well, now you know I've hidden nothing from you. Yes, said the disciple. Dr. Austin explained to me in neurological and Zen terms what had once happened to me. Many years ago, I was out walking in the Guatemala countryside and we were surveying parrot nests and we weren't seeing many parrot nests. So we took up a lively conversation with my Guatemala colleague. And he began to talk to me about his love for Mary and Jesus. And I was beginning to be a little bit on guard. I wasn't sure if he wanted something from me that I couldn't give, or perhaps he was proselytizing. And so this conversation came up just as we came to a forest patch. And on the edge of this forest patch, the sun was just coming up over the treetops in mist. And then suddenly a flock of loud parrots burst from the tree canopy. And the next thing I knew, I was down on the ground on my knees weeping. I don't know what happened. Awe, wonder. I surely felt embarrassed. But what stayed with me so long after that incense was a sudden clarity and connection to humanity and the world. I knew that when people said words like Mary and Jesus, it's like when I said birds and trees, and I fell a little bit more in love with the world. Seeing birds might not lead to a sudden clarity, but birds as a mindful practice with repetition can build up benefits over the long term. And there's two ways that this can take, a, take effect. One is from the general unfocused glaze, such as looking up or out over birds or mountains or waters, being openly receptive to whatever comes. In the other way is a more cognitive focused attempt to identify a bird or to try to figure out the behavior. Both aspects are a mindfulness practice with resulting benefits. Cognitive understanding, and the open reception, they both lead to astonishment, which is the second step in Mary's instructions. Be astonished. We can grow our awe and wonder by not taking any birds we see for granted. One time early in our relationship, I was out with Meredith and we were looking at birds and I didn't think he knew very much about birds. So when a bird went over, he said, what is that? And I said, it's just a crow. And he said, just a crow? Tell that to the crow. He had me. I was being a speciesist. There is so much to be in awe about with crows. They remember human faces and actions. So if someone stresses them, they'll not just avoid that person, but they'll warn all their other friends about that person. So it's good to not cross a crow. Crow calls also distinguish individuals, uh, which means they have names, as do parrots who are taught their names by their parents in the nest. Crows and ravens also have native words to describe particular situations and warning calls. They even have a word for meat. Parrot, parrots have dialects and some birds, such as great tits and finches, use natural syntax in their calls. They order and combine their calls to have very specific meanings. Parrots also use syntax with human language, not just to mimic, but to construct new meanings as well, using human language. Humans also share with birds social complexity and cognitive intelligence. In some cases, Parrots score higher on intellectual tests than college students, even when they haven't pulled an all-nighter. Parrots are rated at a level of cognitive ability to that of a five-year-old human. Every year, new studies, every month, really, new studies are published, such as one that recently came out about what's going on inside of some birds, such as crows and parrots. They found out that they're brain matter, their cognitive brain matter, is more densely packed with neurons than 
every grade ape but us. And it's structured in similar ways as to grade apes. It turns out that parrots may be as smart or smarter than champions and dolphins. Yet I grew up in a time when birds were considered very dissimilar to humans and low on intelligence. But then came a paper, a scientific paper in 2005 that said, uh, whoops, birds may not have a neocortex, the cognitive thinking, higher function thinking tissue in their brains, but they have something called a neopaleo. They evolved their intelligence in what's called convergent evolution. It's a different tissue to do the same things that we do. And they also did the same thing with their ability to live a long time, as well as their auditory learners. They culture teaches birds how to, to sing and do calls. That also goes all the way back to when they were theropod dinosaurs. So they are a lot like us. They develop the same traits that we did, but from a different line on convergent evolution. But we had missed the signs of what was going on for them because we didn't look, or at least not until recently. Perhaps it's because they seem so different from us. We, we couldn't see the connections. After all, they don't have the same kind of spatial expressions we do, but if we really look, we can study their eyes and their bodies and the way their feathers move. And it's a language in and of itself. They say and do similar things but with sounds, calls, language, and culture, that's not the same as ours. By paying attention, we can be astonished even across the differences. In the past, we didn't ask, what would the parrots say? We are learning that parrots do not just mimic speech and the world is not a, a mirror so that we only see ourselves. Birds can help move us out of seeing the earth as a human projection. They help us listen, pay attention, be astonished, so we can hear what life is really telling us. We need them, because there's something that humans do that we struggle with. We construct our social reality. What does that mean? It means we humans make up stories to explain our behavior and motivations and define shared meaning. If we only include humans in the story, we are missing a huge part of reality. And also, if we happen to repeat the same stories we have heard and learned, we compound the problem. For the more a story is repeated, even if the first time we heard it, we knew it was false, if we keep hearing the same story and story, we begin to believe it. We so much know this from mass information on the internet these days. We used to say the birds were dumb. They don't have feelings, they don't use tools. We got it wrong. Not just about them, but about so many groups of people and other species. There is much to unlearn. We can't believe anything we believe. So if we want to live in a reality that is kind, compassionate, and beautiful, and we want to pass this on to future generations, we have to tell stories of interconnected beauty and worth now and tell them over and over again, because we construct the world we want to live in. We do this through thought, action, and word. By repeating as much as possible, just and loving words, we encant a better world as will our choir now singing down to the river to pray. Going down to the river is like a prayer for the impacts of looking over water or being in and around water positively impacts us as do landscapes and birds. But what do we do after we come back from the river? What do we do after we've seen a bird? The last instruction for Mary Oliver after paying attention and being astonished is this. Talk about it. What would you say? In our nonprofit organization, One Earth Conservation, we figure out what to say, and we do it with a, a board policy that has us ask, what would the parrot say? What would the parrot have us do? What would the people say and have us do, these people who live with the parrots? 
as we listen to what the birds are telling us, we can then share the story of their beauty, wonder, and tragedy. The birds of the world are in trouble. The population of North American birds since the 1970s is down 30%. That's over 3 billion birds lost. Over a half of the parrot species are endangered and their numbers are falling rapidly as are many other bird species in the world. We mourn for their loss and so do they. Magpies have been seen putting pieces of grass and flowers over a dead companion and parrots will mourn and become depressed after losing a mate. During the West Nile virus pandemic about 15 years ago in North America, over two thirds of the American crows died. The remaining crows mourned, they changed. They experienced individual and social trauma. These are the conclusions that scientists who studied them during this time came to. They saw that females didn't disperse from their biological families and territories as they used to, and these territories shrunk. Birds were reluctant to try new things. Crows normally move as small family groups, but these families were torn asunder. So what did they do? They forged new families, such as adults taking care of chicks from another pair. Does this response to a pandemic a loss in your life sound familiar to what the crows are doing? We are bound together in this world across differences and their story is ours and it needs to be told. W.S. Brender writes, I hear the cry of a wounded animal. Someone shoots an arrow at the moon and a small bird has fallen from her, death, her nest. People must be awakened. Witness must be given so that life can be guarded. Birds tell us of beauty and tragedy. And no doubt, by facing their reality, we see that there is a crack in the world. As Kim sung in Leonard Cohen's song anthem earlier, the dove will be sold again and again. And so will the parrot as well as the lives and futures of countless others. Yes, Cohen tells us that there is a crack in everything, but that's how the light gets in. I witnessed such a story of cracks and light several years ago in Honduras. An elderly leader of an indigenous mosquito community was talking to me and she said, come on and, and see our scarlet macaw. As you saw in some of the stories, scarlet macaws are coveted for pets and they're in trouble. I didn't really wanna see a captured bird, but she said, no, no, it's okay. We didn't clip the bird's feathers. The bird flies and is just choosing to be with us. And as she said this, she turned around and turned to Cindy, her granddaughter and said, go get your parrot. So in Cindy walked with this rainbow bird whose length was as tall as Cindy was. And they started to roll around on the floor together, laughing and playing. Both of them about four years of age. They were growing up together. A few years after that, I went back to visit the grandmother and Cindy and the macaw were gone. I asked the grandmother, what, what happened? And she said, oh, it was a terrible thing. Sydney's mother came to get her and take her back to the city. And there was no way that wild bird could go back to the capital city. So we lied to Cindy. We told her we would send the bird later after her, after she had moved to the capital city. And as Cindy drove away in the car with the window down, she hung out of it sobbing, crying, my macaw, my macaw. I still hear her screams and see her tears, the grandmother said. Cindy would call and I would tell her the bird was fine, but the bird was not fine. A few days after Cindy left, that bird pulled out almost every one of her feathers and refused to eat. The grandmother took a deep breath and continued. 
after about a year, those feathers grew back in and the macaw started to fly further and further. And one day a pair of wild macaws flew over our house and our macaw took off after that pair of macaws. And I started to call her back, but then I listened to what the birds were saying. But I didn't want to have to tell Cindy that the bird was gone, but I heard them say that the bird wanted and deserved to be free, as do we all. The grandmother told me this as she put her hand over her heart, her voice cracking in the light of the sun glistening in her tears. Hearts break open when we open them to the birds and to each other. But oh, how the light gets in. And oh my gosh, how the light shines out. One study showed how people who imagine they are a sick or an ailing bird afterwards will score higher on empathy and a greater willingness to work for environmental concerns. Being with birds teaches us important lessons on how to live this life. Pay attention, be astonished, tell about it, and oh yes, repeat as necessary. Blessed be, amen, shalom.